Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series here at BFG Financial Advisors. My name is Cody Niedermeyer, and I am the host of said webinar, uh, webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing understanding your employee benefits package. And, you know, we timed this up to be at this portion of the year because this is where a lot of companies have their open enrollment. Um, so we thought it would be perfect to discuss today. Um, at BFG, we keep track of, you know, when all of our clients' employee benefit um, opportunities are open to them because uh, it's really something to take advantage of and have a full understanding of um, just to help you reach your goals. And we are lucky enough to have Lena Nebel, one of the principals back, who I think has joined us the last three webinars. And I think it's going to be the last one she joins this year. So uh, she's gracing us with her presence again. Uh, <laughs> Lena, welcome back. Hi, Cody. It's good to be here again. This is actually one of my favorite topics because I know it impacts a lot of people, regardless if they're full-time or part-time in every stage of their career. So I'm happy that we can uh, end my, my webinar series with you on, on this topic. Yeah, this is, uh, this is our parting gift to you. So uh, you. <laughs> this is a big thank you uh, for all the times you've been able to jump on with us. And just as a reminder to those tuning in for the first time or tuning in again, uh, all of our previous webinars are actually recorded, so you're going to be able to watch them, you know, whenever you see fit, and they get uploaded to YouTube, and you can find uh, all access to them through our website at bfgfa.com. Um, but without further ado, uh, I think we we jump into this, Lena, and start with our fun disclosure side that uh, everyone enjoys so thoroughly. <laughs> but uh, I think we really get started with uh, kind of an overview of everything that gets incorporated in benefit options. And I love this slide uh, that you actually were able to put together. And if you don't mind, it's a, it's a good introduction. Sure, sure. So um, it, it's interesting. We have been uh, revisiting with our company some of our benefits and everything. So I just ended up Googling, you know, top 10 benefits offered by employers. And it's amazing to see the types of benefits that are out there these days compared to just a few years ago. So um, what we did is we just basically lumped the more popular ones into really three categories. There's your career benefits, there's personal, and then of course there's financial, which is where we're going to probably spend the majority of the time because that's where people tend to focus on their employer benefits um, really is on the on the financial side. So this, like I said, it's just um, kind of a, a hit list of some of the more popular ones, but there's just a ton of different benefits that are out there these days um, with, with various companies. Yeah, and I mean, I just know based on our relationships with our clients and, you know, personal experience first, you know, getting into the, the first job is people get overwhelmed with this. You know, you get a big benefit packet and it's got all this information in it. And, you know, a lot of people don't take the time to read through it, but, you know, it's extremely important to know the resources that you have out there to you. So I think we start at the top of the triangle and jump into, you know, the career benefits aspect. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the career benefits are anything that can further your career with the help of your current employer. And uh, it's interesting, just yesterday, actually, I saw this commercial for Amazon um, where an individual is using um, Amazon, Amazon's tuition reimbursement plan to go into nursing. So it's not that wow. Amazon has nurses, but this is a career that this individual wanted to pursue. So a lot of the time, some of the educational assistance programs um, are designed to benefit your current field that you're in, mm -hmm. but there are employers that will um, uh, provide some type of reimbursement, even in a, a completely different field. Um, so some of the, the more popular ones, just again, in-house training programs, which are, you know, mentorships or a path to partnership at some level. Um, as an example, you know, internally, we have a growth plan for many of our employees that outlines the steps they need to take to get to, you know, their level and, and their career path. So when somebody is interviewing, they want to know, well, what are my next steps? How can you get me from A to B um, versus just kind of being stuck in, in that um, position? Um, professional registrations, you know, that allows you to highlight your knowledge, understanding, and competence in a particular area. Um, and with designations, you know, usually there's a fee for that designation that needs to be covered. Uh, we have in our uh, office. We have many advisors who have the certified financial planner mm -hmm. designation. Um, we'll soon have another one in November. And uh -huh. there's an annual fee that's required every year to maintain that designation um, that 
our company, you know, pays. And so for a lot of individuals, if they're pursuing different designations or licenses, it's important to understand, is the employer going to pay that or is the employee going to be responsible for that? Because that can cost money um, for the employee if, if they have to do that. Uh, memberships to professional organizations and societies. Uh, so things related to your industry, uh, you know, if there are certain organizations um, in, you know, the, the medical community, the financial community, the, the legal community, um, the employer will pay for those memberships to, again, further your knowledge. Sometimes it's a lot of business development is why people want to get into some of those organizations. Um, but again, that can be very pricey depending on the organizations that you're involved in. Um, so this, is a, this can be a great benefit that your employer can offer. Um, and then obviously the, the um, more popular one um, would be educational assistance program. So part of this could be what I had just mentioned, tuition reimbursement. Um, so very common for individuals looking to get a, a master's or a PhD or again, further designations. Um, this wouldn't be relating to paying off student loans, which you know we can discuss later because there's been a lot of changes in that area over the past year. Um, but it's about uh, paying for classes that are more than likely related to the field that that individual is in. Um, there can also be assistance for continuing education client, uh, continuing education classes. So as an example, in the financial industry, um, we have a lot of CE, a lot of continuing education needed mm -hmm. for securities, insurance, our designations. So if the employer is willing to pay for all of those good, uh, for all those courses to keep you in good standing, um, that's great. Again, these are all different types of benefits that a lot of people really don't focus on when uh, interviewing for a job. And I would say the career benefits are really focused on when somebody is first starting out in their career, kind of the, you know, graduated from college and, and wanting to look at what all of these options are. I think for individuals who are already established in their field, um, really where they're going to be focused on is probably the professional registration. And then of course, you know, membership to professional organizations and, and societies. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the career benefits I would say is kind of the individuals who are, are first starting out. Th these are pretty big to look at. Um, and so, as you said, you know, things can be a little overwhelming when you get all that information, but it's important to take the time and, and really going through that and um, understanding what your new employer can offer you to get you to where you want to be in your career. Yeah. And I, like you said, I think for individuals just starting off in a career, this is, you know, you're at the end of the interview and they ask, do you have any questions for us? I think this is a great route to go just to stimulate that conversation rather than saying, Nope, I'm good. And then right. you're out you're you're out the door versus, you know, what tools can you provide me to help, you know, me grow uh in order to achieve my dreams. And I think that goes a long way in uh when you're actually doing those interviews or giving the interview of saying, Oh, this person's really inclined and you know, tuned in and ready to go. Absolutely. And from there we uh we got done at the top of the triangle and we start to work our way down into uh, the more personal benefits and different things like wellness programs and uh, PTO or pay time off. If uh, you wouldn't mind diving into this a little bit. Sure. Um, so this I think is one area that a lot of people overlook. Um, there are so many different ad hoc programs that the employer offers that people just don't take advantage of. Um, years ago, when um, my husband and I were having a family, his employer offered a ton of benefits related to the pregnancy process, whether it was counseling, um, whether it was somebody I could just call to ask, you know, is this normal? How do you do this? How do you do that? Um, it was great to be able to have those resources. Um, there's a lot of different wellness programs that have discounts towards fitness centers, weight loss education, um, quitting smoking. Uh, again, personal story, my, my husband gets reimbursed if he needs to buy tennis shoes for working out. So there's a certain amount of credit he gets towards athletic equipment, um, which is interesting, but, and you would never know that there could be um, other types of benefits that not covered under wellness, but maybe discounts for vet insurance or adoption benefits, um, legal services or counseling. Um, I know we have a program um, at work to where we get a credit within our health savings account based upon how many 
um, steps we take. So we have a tracker that's part of that, which, yep, and there's a leaderboard <laughs> that's on there. I, I never see you uh -huh. on that leaderboard, though, Cody, so uh -huh. have to have to work on that. Um, I, I but need there's, to get outside more. <laughs> right, but there's um, there's credits towards gym memberships and things like that, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of uh, a lot of different types of personal benefits that they're usually in the back of the booklet that you have to go through just to kind of see, okay, well, what's some of that free stuff that's out there that your employer is offering? You definitely want to take advantage of of those wellness programs. Um, Pay time off. Pay time off has become a bigger topic of conversation. I would mm -hmm. say since you know. COVID showed up uh, about 18 months ago. Um, more and more companies, including ours, went to unlimited paid time off. Um, we call it responsible time off um, so that, you know, the employer stops tracking everyone's time off, really just treating everyone mm -hmm. almost as an adult and being responsible yeah. for their scheduling and, and making sure you're still getting your work done. Um, a lot of people can do it remotely now or possibly not during business hours, but it's a great benefit because it allows individuals, if they're parents and they have a sick kid or they want to go see a soccer game or um, their house is getting a repair and um, the contractor is going to be there between the hours of 11 and 3, uh, you know, you don't want to have to sacrifice vacation hours or vacation days for things like that. So this is nice that a lot of employers have started to offer. Um, personal benefits, it's basically a um, work-life balance is how you can yeah. look at it. So for some individuals, they may be applying for a job and it may be a, a lower salary than the one that they're in right now, but their current employer may be offering two weeks where their new employer could be offering four weeks or unlimited PTO. You have to factor yeah. that in when looking at total compensation. So a lot of employers put together the, that total compensation summary for you to show you what all of those benefits are and how they do factor into that total compensation. I think you're going to be seeing more and more about um, pay time off, you know, especially more in the, in the upcoming years, just with everything, uh, you know, kind of how our, our work life is changing, being remote. Um, but other, other items of pay time off is, you know, you, you'd be able obviously to have you know, jury duty, military leave. Mm -hmm. um, we had volunteer day to where if you wanted to go help out for, let's say, Habitat for Humanity for a day, that was your volunteer day. Employers have those types of things. So it's important mm -hmm. to understand, okay, what are what are the times off that, um, that you have? Now, I would say, or I would caution you, don't necessarily ask that question on uh, the first interview. <laughs> you know, how much time do I get off? That can be a turnoff for some employers, yes. but it is an important um question to ask hopefully in the second interview no absolutely and i'm already seeing we're getting a few questions from some people from the audience keep those coming in we're gonna have a q a at the end of this where our marketing director sarah is going to come on and uh you know ask lena and i these questions so please keep those coming and uh this leads us into the base of the triangle or where you know we think there's a lot of meat to this conversation of open enrollment um, and employee benefits uh, so starting with financial benefits and, you know, the idea of uh, retirement plans, you know, some people have a 401k, some people have a 403b, some people think I'm just making up numbers and saying it on camera right now. But uh, if we could dive in a little bit to these, I think it'll be helpful for our listeners. Sure. I think this is where, um, you know, you and Jackie, who's um, another advisor in our office, where you guys spend a lot of your time, especially with the children of clients who are yeah. entering into to their career, their first job, and trying to find out, okay, what do I contribute into this retirement plan? What is a 401k? What is a 403b? What does a match mean? What's a vesting schedule? So there's a lot of education that okay. um, we provide for, uh, you know, individuals just starting into their career and everything. But even people who have been working for 20 and 30 years, it's important to understand what these financial benefits are and your retirement plans in particular. Um, this, I would say, is the one area that people gravitate the most towards when looking mm -hmm. at their individual benefits. Um, so the, the key difference between a 401k and a 403b is the 403b is for tax-exempt organizations like churches and school systems and local governments, federal governments. Um, so you may typically hear a TSP, which is a thrift savings plan, which is the, you know part of the federal government. Um, but if we just kind of summarize them as employer-sponsored retirement plans, that's kind of the umbrella for whether it's a TI CREF, a TSP, a 401k, a 403b, a deferred comp. There's all this type of uh, lingo that's out there. But like you said, the most common ones are 401k and 403b. 
So th these retirement plans um, are accounts where you can contribute each pay period into mm -hmm. some type of investment vehicle. Um, you know, you usually have a consultant that can walk you through how to invest, or if you have an mm -hmm. advisor, they're going to walk you through how to invest. But each payroll, you're going to have some money that's going to go directly into these retirement plans. Um, if you're lucky enough, you may have either matching or you could have a profit sharing contribution. So a matching is where um, an employer is giving you money into your 401k mm -hmm. based upon what you're putting into the 401k. So we call that free money. So as long as you're making some type of contribution, your employer may make that contribution. It just depends if they have that match set up. Um, okay. There could be a profit sharing contribution where regardless if you're contributing or not, they're putting money into the 401k um, because of the profit sharing contribution. So um, for a lot of employers, a profit sharing contribution could be more than what the match mm -hmm. is, or it's actually more for the employees because the employees aren't required to make that contribution. So it's kind of an added benefit, especially for people who may have um, tight cash flow. And yeah. then they're getting, again, like I say, some free money that's, that's going directly in there. Um, so another form of a match could be student loan matching. Um, so some employers will allow the employees to direct their match into their student loan to make a payment. So that's been fairly new. Um, I'd say in the past uh, one to two years that had come out to where the IRS has allowed employers to make matches on the student loan versus going directly into the 401k. Um, and then another key term is a vesting schedule. So a vesting schedule is how long you have to stay with your employer to get their money. So let's say it's a three-year vesting schedule. You have to be there for three years to get that full match or that full profit sharing contribution. Okay. Your money is always vested. So you can always take your money if you leave your employer. But it's important to understand those rules when, it's, when you decide mm -hmm. that you are leaving your employer What's your vesting schedule? Are you leaving a month before you're fully vested and then you're leaving all of this on the table? Um, that's Im important to find out what that vesting schedule is. <laughs> on the investment option side, um, well, actually, I'll talk about the Roth piece in a, um, right now um, because okay. I've been talking about putting contributions into your retirement plan. They can either be what's called pre-tax which helps to reduce your overall taxable income, or they can be uh, after tax, which is usually the Roth option, which okay. there's no tax benefit right now, but it allows that money to grow tax-free for you mm -hmm. down the road. So for a lot of younger individuals, it may make sense to do a Roth option. Also, it makes sense for older individuals too, because they may have too much in some pre-tax buckets. So when it comes time to retire and they're drawing their income, mm -hmm. all of their income is going to be taxable. So it's nice to have some tax diversity in retirement. And I always stress to work with a financial advisor or tax professional to determine the best allocation between pre-tax and Roth. Um, I'd say the majority of companies now have the Roth option within the plan. Um, we see it more and more now. Um, but a few years ago, there were still a ton of employers who didn't. I mean, the federal mm -hmm. government just came out with the Roth TSP, and that took quite some time um, to yeah. get to that point. So um, you want to look at both of those options and where you want that money to go. Do you want it to go pre-tax? Or do you want it to go Roth? And then once you make that decision, you then have to determine, well, how am I going to invest that money? Mm -hmm. So based upon your risk tolerance, your financial plan, what you're comfortable with, um, that's where you're going to allocate you know, particular uh, funds within, within your 401k. For some employers, they have you know, 20 different options. For others, they only have seven. So yeah. it's important to, to make sure that you're um, picking the right allocation. The allocation is going to determine um, the majority of your performance in that account. Um, it's also important to understand you're not touching this money for quite some time. So a lot of people can stomach the risk if they have a long time period ahead of them. Um, it's not going to balloon overnight. It takes time, um, yeah. but consistency and um, uh, just staying with your contributions and monitoring that allocation and rebalancing it over time, that's when you'll start to see the growth within that. You can either work with the advisor that's part of your retirement plan, or mm -hmm. you can um, work with, if you have your own advisor, they can be able to provide an allocation based upon all the other assets 
that they may be managing in conjunction with uh, with the retirement plan. Yeah, and then uh, I actually think a question that was addressed by one of uh, the listeners that came up is perfect for right now. So if okay. you don't mind, just the idea of, okay, you say, let's make a contribution to the 401k and get that free money. Mm -hmm. What if you're making the contribution to the Roth? Does that, do they make the contribution to the Roth or do they make their matching contribution that goes to the traditional account? Great question. Um, so you still get the free money, but it's not mm -hmm. going into the Roth side. It's going into the pre-tax side. So you'll still get the match regardless of where you're contributing the money, but the match will always go onto the pre-tax um, portion. And then when it comes time for you to leave your employer, and let's say you want to roll that retirement account to mm -hmm. your management for a variety of reasons, um, the trustee of the plan will basically send two checks to be deposited into your retirement account. One will be the Roth portion, and then the other will be the pre-tax portion that included if you had pre-tax contributions and included the match. And as long as you deposit those checks within 60 days, no tax event um, that would be needed. And that can also be rolled into your new employer plan um, because the majority of employer plans allow for incoming rollovers. So sometimes when we're going through somebody's financial plan, if we see that they have um, some frozen retirement plans mm -hmm. out there that they're not contributing to anymore from prior employers, will determine is it in their best interest to consolidate them all into the new plan because of other strategies we can leverage or is it Absolutely. beneficial for them to roll that out into let's say their own ira or even do some conversions into a Roth? so there's as you know cody there's a ton of strategies um, that you can do within the retirement plans for people who are working and for people um who are no longer with that employer mm -hmm. um you know the in service distribution rules that people are unaware of when you get to be certain ages when still working for the employer, they allow you to take that money out and control it. And then you can have all the investment options available to you. And there's not a taxable issue if you move that money directly into, let's say, an IRA account. Mm -hmm. um, so for many individuals, let's say if they're, you know, with the government, and they have the TSP plan that has a handful of options. Um, when they're 59 and a half, they can roll that into their own IRA. They they still can contribute to their TSP. They still can keep their match, but it allows mm -hmm. them to really um, control, have some more flexibility, have some more oversight mm -hmm. on that asset. So there's um, there's a lot of strategies. And so, as you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we do, and quite honestly, a lot of advisors do is, mm -hmm. you know, request a plan summary document. Let's understand the rules of those retirement plans. That's really where you're going to get into the meat of vesting schedule, matching, loan options, distribution options, et cetera. Um, the other thing that's important to, to talk about also regarding retirement plans is your beneficiary designation. Yes, Who is. is going to inherit these assets should something happen to you? A lot of people forget to put the beneficiaries on here. You want to make sure you have that listed properly. Um, within your beneficiaries. They are not going to remind you that you forgot to list somebody and that mm -hmm. could cause adverse consequences to your heirs. Um, so you list them when you're setting up the plan and then revisit it every year because you can get yep. married, you can get divorced, you could have um, children, you may want to incorporate charity. So mm -hmm. it's important to revisit your beneficiaries at least once a year. I can't tell you how many times we've reviewed beneficiaries and people are convinced that their spouse is that person. Sometimes it's the former spouse. Sometimes it's nobody listed at all. So it's important to look at, get confirmation of who that beneficiary is. Yeah, life happens. And you know, when those changes happen in life, there's, there's adjustments that need to be made at kind of all aspects of your financial plan. So I think that was really important to, uh, to definitely touch on, especially at the end of the retirement accounts, but also when it comes to you know, the insurance benefits, that's a that's another type of financial benefit that are offered through employers. And there's a as everybody can see on the PowerPoint right now, you know, there's there's a lot of different options and different ways that employers can offer different types of insurance to their employees. Yeah, absolutely. This could be a whole webinar of itself of the different types of insurance benefits. Um, depending on your stage in your career, this may be more important or less important than, let's say, the 401k. You know, for mm -hmm. um, a family, they may be more concerned about, well, what's your health insurance coverage versus, you know, what's my match on the 401k? Somebody just starting out, they may say, what's the match on the 401k? So, again, 
I, we keep emphasizing revisiting all the benefits available to you. Um, health insurance, again, that's obviously uh, very popular. We all know what health insurance is as far as coveraging, covering uh, medical, dental, vision. It, they can have various plans um, with different deductibles, co-pays, prescription coverage. Um, you know, something that's becoming more common is offering an incentive if an employee doesn't take the insurance. So let's say um, my spouse is on my health insurance, um, his employer may give him a credit in his paycheck for not taking their insurance, which in the end would save that company some money. Um, so that's been popular over these past few years. Um, when comparing different health insurance plans, you don't always want to look for the cheapest. You want to find something that works for you and or your family based on the needs of you know, your family, just like dental and vision insurance. So um, when we had young kids, we didn't really have any dental insurance or vision, you know, wasn't necessary. But as they got older, realizing braces are in our future, we made sure during open enrollment, we signed up for that dental plan. Um, and having two kids that are going through that, it's good that we did that. And same thing with vision. As they get older, you want to be able to have, have something there. So as your life changes, you're going to make changes to the health insurance, which is why it's important to understand when your open enrollment is. Um, also under uh, health insurance is, you know, a more and more popular type of plan is what's called a health savings account. So some people think the health savings account is like the flexible savings account, which is a use it or lose it, but it's not. Think about it like a Roth IRA for your health insurance. It allows people covered by high deductible plans to receive tax um, preferred treatment when mm -hmm. making contributions into that plan. And then when you're using it for medical purposes, it's all tax free. The key to the HSA is if you can, don't take distributions from the HSA. Mm -hmm. Let that grow and compound and roll over each year so that you have a very healthy HSA balance by the time you are retired. If you have money in the bank that can pay for the co-pays or prescription coverage, use the money in the bank. Don't use the HSA. Mm -hmm. Let that money compound. That's how you're getting the maximum benefit from that HSA. Um, flexible savings account, that's the use it or leave use it or lose it. So that could be used for uh, dependent care, summer camps, uh, health insurance or health co-pays, co-insurance, dental bills, et cetera. The, the issue with the flexible spending account is you need to estimate what that amount is that you're going to spend the mm -hmm. next year. So that's why there's usually a rush in the dental offices or when you're going um, to get glasses or contacts, there's this big push in November and December because everyone's trying to use their FSA benefit so that they don't lose that. Um, yeah. So those are kind of the, the more popular options under, under health insurance. Um, mm -hmm. And then under uh, uh, with the HSA, the contributions have been increasing a little bit each year. And then if you're over 55, you get to put a little bit more money away into that plan. Um, but it's a, it's a great plan that hopefully continues to get expanded upon and, and more and more individuals um, use it. Yeah. Under the um, basic and term life, that's just your life insurance. And so life insurance, there could be, you know, a few different options um, that can cover the employee. It can cover the spouse. It can cover the dependents. It's typically free up to a certain amount. There's usually uh, no underwriting up to a certain level. But the issue with employer life insurance is it increases each year. So for some people, it may make sense to buy an insurance policy outside of their employer because they may be able to get more um, that won't be increasing each year. Um, so the other type of insurance could be accidental death and dismemberment. Um, we're not big fans of that insurance just because you have to die a certain way or lose a yeah. limb for it to pay out. It's very cheap, but um, you know a lot of people think the accidental death and dismemberment, which AD&D, is their life insurance. They may say, oh, we have $4 million in life insurance when they only have $50,000. The rest is covered through A, D, and D. And again, you have to go a certain way, which is unfortunate. Yes. Uh, we have travel and accidents. So for a lot of people who are traveling, there could be some type of payout if they get into a car accident or pass mm -hmm. away in the event of, of them traveling um, through, you know, with work. So there could be some additional insurance there. And then um, workers' comp. Workers' comp is if you get injured on the job, how are they going to help you? So you see a lot of workers' comp. 
um, programs in the, whether it's in the construction space and, you know, like FedEx, UPS delivery drivers, people where there's um, more of, of a way to, you know, injure yourself. Um, it's very hard for uh, you and I to injure ourselves when we're, you know, sitting behind the computer sometimes. So, paper, paper um, cut. right, exactly, exactly. Uh, and then another um, popular one is disability insurance. Disability insurance is one I would say that the majority of people don't take advantage of, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. Disability insurance is what if you can't perform your job to a certain level, uh, your employer will still you know, pay you a percentage of your salary. There is short-term disability and there is long-term disability. And again, there could be a what's called a waiting period. You know, How long mm -hmm. do you have to be disabled for, for the benefits to be paid out? Um, they could limit it based upon income. Um, and like I said, there could be short-term versus long-term. So short-term is typically um, starts on day one of you getting injured. Let's say you, you know, break both of your legs and you can't come into work at all. Um, short-term would kick in and usually pays up to 90 days. And then mm -hmm. if you're still disabled after 90 days, that's when the long-term disability kicks in. We see a lot of people not um, getting the disability insurance because they think that's not going to happen to them. Um, we've seen a lot of people get sick with COVID and we've seen a lot of short-term disability and unfortunately things that have turned into long-term disability that has to get paid out. Um, mm -hmm. So I encourage people to look at their disability programs. Um, some things are offered from the employer as far as the cost is concerned, the employer will pay for it. And other times the employee has to pay for it. There could also be supplemental disability insurance mm -hmm. that can pay more disability than that's currently provided, like your life insurance. You have a basic amount and you can apply for more. Um, you want to look to see what your coverage for, what your current salary is, what they're going to pay up to, and you may want to get a supplemental disability plan as well. Uh, disability insurance is typically how maternity leave is paid for for a lot of females. Um, and, you know, a lot of people tend to waive the short-term disability, but that's what's needed if you're going to want to start a family and everything. Um, yeah. It, you know, minimal cost, but it can have a pretty big impact if you don't have that. Another type of insurance that's not listed on here um, is also long-term care insurance. So a lot of employers have started offering long-term care insurance um, to pay for nursing home, assisted living, adult daycare, things like that. They can cover the employee and the spouse. And when you leave that employer, you can take that insurance with you. It's called porting the insurance. Um, disadvantage is it increases each year, just kind of like mm -hmm. the, the life insurance, but it's limited underwriting. So for some people who may not be able to get qualified on their own, possibly looking at a long-term care insurance policy within the employer would be a good benefit. Yeah. No, I think that's a great overview of, you know, all of the insurance options that employers have to offer to their employees. And it kind of leads, leads into another one of just, you know, there are more benefits that employers can offer. And some of them are offered through, um, you know, employee assistant programs, student loan assistance, like we've touched on already, as well as, you know, different types of stock ownership plans um, that kind of like what we said before, we could go into a completely its own yeah. webinar with, but uh, I'd appreciate it. And I'm sure a lot of listeners would, if you can give a kind of brief overview of each of these. Sure. So the employee assistance program, um, as we kind of talked a little bit before, it could be offering financial and legal services. So let's say you need to get a will done. They may have some type of legal plan offered um, to where you're paying a, a very cheap amount per pay to be able to, you know, contract with an attorney who's able to draft all of those documents and everything. There could be, as I mentioned, things about um, maternity services, adoptions. Um, so there could be a lot of different types of programs for those employees um, covered under those, those different areas. Mm -hmm. um, student loan assistance, we talked about the matches into the 401k, but something too that's been um, becoming more popular is <clears throat> different states or employers are doing something regarding the reimbursement um, of their actual student loan. So this is different than tuition reimbursement, but helping to pay off a student loan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so as an example, Texas, has a public service loan forgiveness program for their state employees um, to where if there's any balance left after the term of 10 years, the, the loan's forgiven. So for some yeah. of our Texas clients that um, are working for the state, we have that counter on there because we don't want them to quit on the ninth year 
and then <laughs> give up all of that um, that loan that could be paid off. Federal yeah. government also has a program a lot of people aren't aware of um, that allow the agencies to make up to ten thousand dollars of student loan payments per year. Of course, you have to be eligible for it. You got to file all the fun paperwork. Um, <laughs> but if you know anybody you know, currently works for the federal government and they want more information about that, um, please reach out to us. We'll send you the, the links and everything. Um, but there's different states that, that offer different plans. And then employee stock ownership plans, um, that, Cody, that we can go on and on for yes. um, regarding all the different types of plans. But just to kind of give a, a high-level view, there could be an employee stock purchase plan. There could be restricted stock units. There could be an ESOP. There could be stock options. There could be a ton of ways in which the employer is offering shares of that company um, as a supplemental financial benefit. And you want to incorporate your CPA, your financial advisor to understand the tax impact to you. Mm -hmm. You absolutely need to understand the vesting schedule because you could leave money on the table if you leave your employer and those shares have not yet vested. So it's important to, to understand that a lot of tech firms offer these as kind of a, a sign on bonus. Mm -hmm. um, they'll offer, you know, some shares within the company. Um, so again, this, as I said, um, some ideas for webinars in the future, we could definitely go down the rabbit hole on uh, employee stock stock plans. Yeah. And in regards to your discussion about the student loan reimbursement with Texas or federal government agencies, we, you just gave the brief overview. We actually dove into these a lot deeper in one of our previous webinars. Uh, for those who haven't listened, uh, it was creative ways of paying off debt and student debt. Um, and those are one of the recordings and, you know, one of the free tools for you guys to check out that, you know, can hopefully provide you with some information. But um, I guess moving on is, you know, there are some companies out there that are starting to realize the importance of financial planning for uh, their employees. And, you know, they're establishing different types of corporate financial wellness programs for them because, you know, they're they're trying to, you know, go above and beyond to, you know, get the employees that are the most sought after. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what these corporate financial wellness programs are, how they work um, and kind of dive into that? Sure. So. A lot of times for, I would say, your, your larger companies, um, they're going to have some type of, whether it's a, a financial advisor, financial company, you know, Fidelity is a big one, to where you can call their 800 number, speak to somebody over the phone, and ask about you know, how you should be allocated, what are some things you should yeah. be aware of within the retirement plan. And, and that's usually where it stops, unfortunately. Um, they don't really take the blinders off and think about your whole financial world. Um, we saw that that was an area that um, was mm -hmm. untapped. So we wanted to be able to offer more companies the ability to have a true financial wellness program. Um, and so it's been extremely successful for our firm in being able to mm -hmm. offer um, these types of programs to companies, small or large, that allows um, individuals like us to meet with the employees one-on-one -on -one as, a, as a free consultation to talk about beneficiary planning, um, student loan payoff, mortgages, um, how to buy a house, how to save for education, beneficiary designations, 401k allocations, um, all of those areas that encompass somebody's financial life besides just how you should be allocated. So um, I encourage everybody that's listening or watching this right now, mm -hmm. if your employer does not offer this, try and push them to offer this. It's no cost to them. Um, it's just a, a value add that can provide a significant benefit to a lot of, a lot of their employees because um, as you have it right here on the um, slide, you know, financial stress, um, it, it's a big thing for a lot of employees. And if employees don't have that stress anymore, um, if by offering something like this to where they have a resource where they can call somebody and speak to somebody who knows their situation, um, that's huge for a lot of people. So I think you're going to see more and more of this over these upcoming years just because of how um, people's financial lives have become more and more complicated, especially with new tax laws out there that are constantly changing and mm -hmm. um, all these different types of benefits. And, and again, as I said in the beginning, this is just kind of a highlight of the benefits. There's each slide, you could have a webinar yeah. uh, to really go through it. That's why I love this topic because it can really impact everybody in a, po in a very positive way. No, I, I agree with you completely. And, you know, for those of 
that have joined us, you know, what are some of the top career tips or, you know, summation of, you know, what they should take away from this webinar? Yeah, so here's just kind of a, a list, um, regardless of your stage in life that you're in, um, whether it's contributing enough to get the retirement account to the full match. You know, if you were, let's say, um, about to retire, we may want you to increase those contributions. If you're retiring September 1st, on January 1st, we're going to want to make sure you max out your plan from January to September. A lot of people don't think about that. Um, you want to make sure that you're, um, with each pay raise, that you're increasing the contributions that you're putting into your retirement plan as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that will allow you to kind of budget that raise and, and have that money go in there, um, which is part of the, you know, pay yourself first and, and spend less than, than you make. Um, yeah. Read your benefits package. I can't stress that enough. You know, it's important to get all the PDFs, sit down with the HR coordinator, understand everything that you have, and obviously paying attention to that vesting schedule. Um, beneficiary information is is a big one. You know, we, yeah, yeah. Um, as all the employees here, we have our own financial plan where we sit down with an advisor. And, and as I mentioned, every year we look at beneficiaries. And I do this, you know, for my husband and I, we sit down with our advisor and when it was time to prove our beneficiaries, I was, well, I knew what this was because we selected them together. And um, what I didn't realize is that my my husband's employer um, eliminates that beneficiary every year. You have to um, basically check the box hmm. during each enrollment to confirm that beneficiary. So if you forgot to check the box, there's no beneficiary listed that year. So hmm. it's important to make sure your beneficiaries are updated and they're who you want it, who you want it to be. Um, Again, disability, even though it costs money, it's important to sign up for things like that. It's not fun stuff. Insurance never is, but it can um, have an, a dramatic impact to your life by, by missing some of these things. Um, so, you know, understanding the value of having time on your side, all of these benefits, whether it's career, personal, mm -hmm. financial, can benefit you over the course of your, you know, of your working life and can benefit not just you, but also your family as well. Oh, I think. That's absolutely spectacular. And, you know, when we have, you know, listeners to this webinar or anybody, what we tell them to look for in a financial advisor is a lot of things that, you know, we do. And, you know, at BFG, we take a look at identifying both your short term and your long term goals to start, because uh, that kind of stems into everything else. Um, we look at your portfolio as a whole. We look at your 401k. We look at, you know, assets that are possibly held with us. Um, we analyze um, where you're at, how to get there. Uh, take a look at that insurance like you talked about that's offered through open enrollments or possibly you might have to get individual. And like you said, you know, insurance is really a lose to win category. So it's not fun to talk about, but it's something that's necessary to kind of create that moat around your castle and protect what you have uh, if, you know, the bad thing were to happen. Uh, we also take a look at those tax returns because kind of everything is shown in there in ways that a lot of people can't read. So we work with CPAs and, you know, we work on lowering that stress level that we talked about in the beginning with, uh, you know, different relationships with financial wellness programs of, you know, it's not just you. You have a team around you to help you reach those goals. And, you know, BFG, we take a lot of pride in that. So these are some of the things that we do before we hop into a little bit of Q&A. So uh, I believe we have Sarah on the line who uh, has been organizing and getting together all the questions that, we, that I've seen that we've received. Uh, and she's gonna pull a few of them for Lena and I to go through before, uh, before we let you guys go from this webinar. Sarah, are you there? Yes, sir. Awesome. Um, we, we did get a really good question that um, I think will be relevant for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. With that um, health savings account, um, they've heard a lot of good things about it, but you can only get it with that high deductible plan. How do you know if that's the right one for you um, and if you should go with that high deductible or go with a lower deductible and spend less out of pocket? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, it's a very popular question for a lot of individuals when they first get the opportunity to have an HSA. And I always tell people, if you see the doctor maybe once, twice a year, you maybe have one prescription, um, you don't need any regular um, injections, you don't have, uh, you know, monthly checkups with the doctor for various ailments, then the HSA is the best 
plan mm -hmm. for you because you're able to, you know, put money into the HSA. Your premium is lower on the high deductible plan versus if you had a ton of prescriptions, if you had family members that had to see doctors, um, you know, monthly or quarterly, you're going to be spending a lot of money and the HSA is probably not going to make um, the, the most sense. One thing with an HSA that people can do is they can actually kickstart that account with a rollover um, directly from their IRA. So for um, some older individuals, um, that may make the most sense to where we transfer a portion of their IRA into the HSA so that they have some money in there. So if on January 10th, they have some major medical event and they have to hit that deductible, they can take it right out of the HSA, which is all tax free. Um, you can only do that once in your lifetime. You can't do it each mm -hmm. year to make that rollover. Um, but that's why HSAs tend to be more popular with younger individuals because they don't have you know, a lot of prescriptions or, or a lot of um, regular visits that may be needed to the doctor. Yeah. And Lena, another thing with HSAs that I think you kind of alluded to, but just a little more specific of, you know, that account can accumulate, if, especially if you're not touching it and you continue to make contributions of a lot of HSAs have a minimum of about a thousand or two thousand dollars that, you know, once that amount is in there, every amount over that can be invested. So you're going to be given investment options. So you definitely want to take a look at that, like a lot of your other accounts to make sure it's invested properly for, you know, what your goals are. Correct. You got something else for us, Sarah? All right, thank you for that. Um, for um, the vesting schedule, how does that work? Is it all everything gets vested but once you hit that number or how? what exactly does that mean? So there's different types of vesting schedules. Um, there could be a cliff vesting schedule where at the end of let's say that three year time period, everything is vested at three years or it could be gradual to where it's a percentage each year. So let's say it's a four-year vesting schedule. It could be 25% each year. So it really depends on the employer. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all. It's really what how they design the plan um, within, within that. But it's important to know what that vesting schedule is. And it's traditionally listed out in the plan summary document with the percentages listed. So if, again, my example of three years, it could say year one, 0%, year two, 0%, year three, 100%. That means those first two years that you've satisfied employment there, you're not vested. You have to be there for three full years to get 100% of that employer match. Keep them coming, Sarah. I think we got time um, for about I'm just, one or two. I'm going more. through the list. Um, if you are... Um, handling your investments in your 401k yourself, how often should you be switching them up and changing your investments? Not daily or monthly, I will tell you that. Don't even look at it every day. Um, minimally, you want to do it at least once a year. You want to rebalance it. A lot of uh, retirement plans have an automatic rebalancing feature. Um, that's good and bad because it's, it's good because it'll automatically happen for you. You don't have to think about it. It's bad because you're not thinking about it. You may want to change the allocation. Um, so I would say one to two times a year, depending on if there's new investment funds that have come through, if your risk tolerance has changed, if you're contributing more, if the employer is starting to put more in, um, but no less than once a year. And please, please, please try not to look at it every day or every month. Yeah. You will drive yourself nuts. And um, when people do that, then they react with emotion and that then causes them to fall um, further behind. Absolutely. I think we got time for one more, Sarah. All right, let me pick a good one. Yep, make sure it is. Um, this is kind of a two-part question for it's, um, another question on 401ks. Hmm. Um, how do I know if I should be, like what my risk tolerance should be? Um, so we'll start with that. Okay. So sometimes um, within your benefit booklets, there is some type of questionnaire that you can go through to understand your risk tolerance. Um, a lot of the risk tolerance can be dictated by your time frame. So if you're younger, you can stomach more risk so you can be more aggressive. So let's assume you went into an aggressive portfolio and after the first year, 
let's say the market did not do what you anticipated it to do and you actually lost money, if that caused you sleepless nights, if that gave you pains in your stomach, if that got you really frustrated, that mm -hmm. tells you you cannot stomach that risk. Okay, and so that's why having some type of financial advisor or advocate to kind of walk you through what's appropriate and what's not and how you change that risk tolerance over time, depending on your needs, is important. Um, but sometimes there is some type of questionnaire when you're going through your open enrollment that will uh, kind of hone in on what your risk tolerance is and that will help you pick an appropriate investment. Okay, so that was that first part of that question and the second part. Um, they want to know if it's more important to be putting a lot into their retirement, even if they don't have um, very strong cash flow. Uh, great question. And yes, yes. no, no. If you do not have strong cash flow and if you need to build up your emergency reserve, build up your emergency reserve, pay off any unwanted debt. That's like high interest rates, like credit cards, et cetera. Um, so don't feel like you have to, you know, pile money into the retirement plan. The only caveat I would say to that is if your employer is offering a match, try to put something in so that you can get some free money. Even if it's one to 2%, you know, it's, it's forcing you to save, forcing you to put some money in, and mm -hmm. then your employer's putting some money too. But um, having a game plan of how to build up your emergency reserve, how much to put into your 401k, your employer retirement plan. And as I said before, as you get a raise, increase your contribution with each raise. That forces you to not spend that money and forces you to put that extra money into the retirement plan. Um, but you want to set up your foundation. You need that emergency reserve set aside, especially if cash flow is not good. Well, Lena, uh, can't thank you enough. Um, just finding the time to be not only on this webinar, but like the ones before. Uh, I think everybody was able to take a lot of information from you and you know, we've all been educated. So thank you. Um, Absolutely. On the screen now uh, that I left on for a little bit is a QR code. So if you actually scan that with your phone, if you pull out your phone, take a picture of it, uh, you'll actually see a link to set up a free consultation with one of our advisors here at BFG. Uh, you know, you know, you can ask these questions, some of the ones that we weren't able to get to maybe, or, um, you know, start identifying some things that, you know, you need to work on in order to reach your financial goals or even, you know, set those goals. But uh, if you take a picture of that and this last screen, I believe it's the last one. I just wanted to make sure that everyone had Lena's information. Um, we've already thanked her and her emails on here, our office phone number, uh, if you guys want to call in. Um, but no, set up that free consultation or send in or email us your, your follow-up questions and we'll do our best to get back to everybody. But, uh, the next time we're going to be on one of these webinars is going to be October 27th, just in time for Halloween. And we're going to have one of the other principals, Eric Rotman back on, and we're going to be discussing, um, how it's not scary, uh, to start planning for your retirement in your twenties. So thank you so much for everybody, uh, tuning into this webinar and, uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, Cody. No problem. Have a good day.